If we're friends on the social media, you'll know my wife Catherine and I recently had some adventures traveling at least at one stop to our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. We posed outside the White House, uh, you know, got to see the security and the, the, the cars and, and peek through the fence wondering if we might set off an alarm. It was a beautiful, I mean, manicured lawns, it's incredible if you haven't seen it. We drove by the Washington Monument, and from every angle and every different side, it seems like everywhere you are in D.C., you can see that monument. At least it felt like that to me. I took a number of pictures from, from various vantage points around the city. We visited the offices of, of one of our representatives, Sam Graves. I just say just a, a quick shout out to Mira in his office, who in the midst of wrangling three brand new interns who had just started the day before, gave us a personal tour of the Capitol. And it was amazing. And, and, and I really appreciated the time and attention she spent with us. If you've been to D.C., you know you can't walk more than a few feet before running into a monument or a memorial or a historic site of some significance, a, a place that made a difference in our country. And we visited many of them. As a guy whose favorite part of U.S. history is that, that span of years leading up to and including the founding of our nation— I ate it up. I love being there and seeing those sites, imagining those people being there and, and doing the, the hard work of, of beginning to create our nation. Now, clearly, a lot of this happened in other parts, Philadelphia, New York, Boston, right? But D.C. is, in, at least in my mind, the place where we've memorialized much of, of that early work. A bit outside of the city, just as an example, we had an opportunity to visit uh, George Washington's estate at Mount Vernon. Again, fascinating. We toured the home and walked the gardens and the orchards, watched a working blacksmith that they have there on site fashioning an, a nail. We also saw the unadorned graves of over 300 enslaved men, women, and children who were buried in the woods along one side of the property. We entered the slave houses, one for men, one for women, and we were reminded that our nation's birth was not tidy or perfect. Then and now, there is much we can agree that is truly wonderful about this great United States of America. I believe we can also agree there was and is much that is incredibly troublesome. That might be a way we understand empires generally. Great accomplishments intertwining with terrible atrocities. With that trip still so fresh in my mind, and as we approach July 4th, I am thinking about how we celebrate our Independence Day. And this year, I'm hopeful that we'll ask, what does freedom mean to us and what might we do with it? For many years, I thought of freedom as being free from others. Independence understood as autonomy, that no one is the boss of me or the boss of you. I feel safe in claiming this is the way I believe a lot of folks that I know think about freedom. The right to do what you want to do, when you want to do it, how you want to do it. It's baked into this rugged individualism that we celebrate as the driving force which allowed us to wrest this land away from our European overlords. No taxation without representation was an early warning cry of those who sought to take advantage of, of all that they were building in this new world. Don't tread on me became a sign and a symbol of the danger of messing with the united colonies while providing the rallying cry needed to carve out our independence as a nation, taken to its modern extreme, we find the United States increasingly isolated, paranoid, and protectionistic. When freedom from others gets lived out, we grow apart. What we experience as a nation is mirrored in our individual lives. 
Our loneliness that we've been lifting up here recently grows, and so we seek distractions that might reinforce what we've come to believe is the right way to remember the struggle to become better than the empires we broke away from. Is there a greater celebration than a fireworks display? Is there a greater distraction than 15 minutes of things blowing up all around you? Here in Kansas City, a local news station recently reported that fireworks on the 4th of July date back all the way to our nation's founding. On July 2nd of 1776, John Adams wrote to his wife that signing the Declaration of Independence, which would happen two days later, should be met with celebrations that included illuminations, the 18th century word for fireworks. And that pyrotech. Those pyrotechnic marvels have illuminated the skies ever since. But I ask, do we need to blow things up? Is it worth the price? Again, according to data shared by the American Pyrotechnics Pyrotechnics Association, in the 21st century, consumer fireworks revenue slowly and steadily ticked up from $407 million in the year 2000 to one billion in the year 2019. In a single year, that number nearly doubled to 1.9 billion in 2020, and then jumped to 2.2 billion in 2021. Fireworks, blowing stuff up around the 4th of July in particular, is big business. Billion, billions of dollars worth of business. As we spend billions as a way of celebrating our joy and being part of this great nation, I, I, I want us to pause and ask a question. Should we be spending our resources that way? I'd like to believe that we are called to do and be more. In teaching his followers about the way that he was inviting them to live, not, not to be free from others, but for others, Jesus shared what we have come to know as the Sermon on the Mount. Here's a piece of that teaching I find helpful as we think about lighting up the the sky this holiday. Reading from Matthew's story of Jesus' life, the Gospel of Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses 14 to 16, we hear these words. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. And now that I've put you there on a hilltop on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. Be By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. So this holiday, this 4th of July, as we celebrate all that is great about our nation, let's shine. Us, me and you, we're meant to be light bearers. We don't have to settle for literally lighting paper on fire for a few moments of celebration. We can let our lives burn with the power of the Spirit as we love our enemies, as we love our neighbors. Because freedom in Christ is a freedom that unites us. By being open with others, Jesus says, by by demonstrating this new way of living, this way of being open with and for others, we will shine and draw others to God by our by our living. If we read Jesus' words and remember his life, in other words, we find it's not freedom from others that he affirmed, rather, it's freedom for others. The Beatitudes, these blessings, a list of blessings that precede our reading, are all about reframing how we think about blessing. So perhaps when we sing God bless America, We might recognize God has blessed America. The question is, what will we do with the blessing? How do we understand blessing? 
If I'm reading Jesus correctly here, to shine is an expression of our belief that we are blessed to bless others. We have been loved so we can love others. We aren't meant to keep that life, that blessing, that love hidden or just to ourselves. Jesus says he's going to make us like a city on a hill. He's going to put us on a, on a, on a lampstand so we might shine for all to see. The truth is, however, that in our, our modern way of thinking about these things, I recognize I can be rewarded for, for waving my flag around and singing patriotic songs as we gather for worship. I'll, I'll, I'll be patted on the back for talking about how exceptional we are as a nation, how set apart and special. If I could arrange a flyover of your house right now, someone would be telling their friends that they're part of the best church ever, right? But instead of seeking that kind of praise, I'm hopeful that we'll celebrate together opportunities, our, our privileges, our power, as those who live in the United States by using all of our advantages to lift others up, to support those who struggle, to aid those who hurt, to comfort the brokenhearted. It is my prayer, my hope, that we will reject the siren song of so-called Christian nationalism that would have us believe our position in the world is proof that God loves us more than anyone else. Jesus rejected that way of thinking. He rejected the use of religion as a prop to promote self-centeredness, greed, anger, and pain. Let us also reject it. Reject using it to justify keeping the lesser ones, those defined as anyone who doesn't look, act, or think like us, from spoiling our party. To return to where we started, our country was born from, from both triumph and tribulation. Let's not gloss over our problems, but let us also not forget our great potential. I may be a bit idealistic. I mean, if you've been to D.C. and you see these monuments, right? If you see these gigantic statues of these, these men these women, right, that, that shaped who we are and, and how we think about who we are, I, I, I might be a bit, bit idealistic. And while those four founders didn't get it all figured out, I believe they saw the potential that I imagine in this country that we could be a great city on a hill, a beacon to the world. As they did their work, they were not looking to build higher walls, but longer tables. A place where all are created equal, where all have rights and responsibilities. A nation held together by a desire to be united in the pursuit of life, liberty, and justice. It seems to me that that vision has grown dim in recent years. What we need are folks just like you, just like me, to add our light to the cause. The world may be impressed by illuminations bursting across the night sky, but the world is changed by men and women and children bearing the light of Christ and sharing it with others. So friends, this holiday season, blow up things if you must. But if you do so, I pray you will also be those who shine, who share the love of Christ with the world. Let us pray. God, I admit that so much of my life has been the experience of distancing myself from my neighbor, of holding others at arm's length, of being free from them so I could pursue whatever it is I thought I wanted to do. But God, I'm, I'm hearing in these words of Jesus that we've shared again here today, 
that we're being invited to a different kind of life. Not one where we exercise freedom from other people, but that we use our freedom and understand it to be a blessing that helps us bless others. God, I don't want to be distracted from that work. I don't want to settle for fireworks and sparklers. God, what I want is a double portion of your spirit that encourages me and supports me and challenges me to live out your love. And God, I don't want this just for me. I pray you you raise up men and women and children who commit themselves to this cause. I believe it's the cause that founded this nation. I believe it's what's been the the heartbeat of what what drove us to want to, to experience a new way, a new life in this new country. And so God, don't let us forget. Forget what it means to be united, what it means to be with and for others. Don't let us forget God. What we celebrate this season is the ideal of of all of us living in love. Help us make it so. It's in the name of Jesus and by the power of his spirit that I pray. Amen.